good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you're all safe and well. It's nice to see you all. And uh, I recognise many of your faces. And I hope you're going to get some great benefit from what we're talking about today. Um, we're talking about refreshing a laptop or a desktop, any sort of computer at all. We're not talking about Apple MacBooks at today particularly, although that's even easier to do. But we're just simply talking about those that operate under the Windows operating system. And you might have an old laptop. I've got one here. You can see it. I've got it in my hand. It's an old HP laptop. It's about 10 or 12 years old. And a little practice yesterday, I went through this course that I'm going to give you today and put it back on there in about 30 minutes. So let's hope that uh, you can see the, um, the benefit of doing this. We're simply going to, and there's a proviso here, we're going to wipe that old computer of yours. Not right now. You're going to do this later. And we're going to wipe it and we're going to reinstall Windows 10. You might very well say to me, how can I do that? Is it legal? Because um, surely I have to buy a new license from Microsoft to do that. Well, that's not the case. In fact, if you've got a, a computer already with Windows on it, and assuming that you know what you're doing, um, it's perfectly legal to do what we're saying. In addition, can I say this? You can install, anybody can install Windows 10. Um, if it's not licensed, you can still use it. it. It just is restricted in some ways. You can't change the desktop and a few other things, but you can use it without a license. So let's get on with the little presentation I've got. And hopefully, um, at the end of it, you'll, you'll have lots of questions to ask me, and I'm sure you will. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to get rid of all the rubbish that's on that old computer of yours. If it's not working at all, well, then there's nothing I can do. You may as well give it away to somebody or take it up to Kim Bricky. But if it is working, but really badly, or it's very corrupt, or it's full of viruses, or it's full of spam, or it's full of ransomware, all those other nasties that are around nowadays, this process I'm talking about, I will fix it for you. We're going to wipe that old PC of yours, whether it's a laptop or a desktop, we're going to remove all the data, all the settings, all of the apps you may have installed. And then at the end of the, the, the process, you're going to put back those things that you want to put back. Another point to make, very often when you go and buy a new laptop, it's filled with stuff you don't want, provided by the manufacturer of the laptop. So if you go and buy a Dell, there'll be 10 or 12 applications there you'll never use. Absolute waste of time. And this method I'm doing gets rid of all those as well. We're going to reinstall Windows 10 and we're going to do it by using a little flash drive. You see one of these. You all know what one of these are. Sometimes called a thumb drive. Sometimes called lots of other things. We're going to use one of those to do it. And the steps that I'm going to show you should produce that sort of result. At the end of the time, you'll be putting back all your data, all that data that you want to put back. And here's a little warning once again. All content on that computer that you're going to do will be lost. There is no exception. There are other ways to do this within the copy of Windows you have, but the method I'm showing you is absolutely foolproof and will get rid of everything, which is a good thing, a good place to start. I do it personally to my computer about every six months. And it never slows down and runs as fast as the day I bought it. So what are you going to need for, for this? You're going to need a flash drive, the one I just mentioned. It's got to be at least eight gigabytes in size. They're about five or six dollars at Officeworks if you if you haven't got one. That's what they look like. Um, you're going to need a login to Windows using a Microsoft username and password. That, ladies and gentlemen, is pretty important because we're not talking about one way you can start a personal computer, that is to log in with what is called a local account. We're using what most people do, and that is using a Microsoft login. Now, the plus of this is if you uh, have OneDrive configured on your computer, and I do hope you have, if you haven't, you should certainly be understanding how OneDrive works. If you log into your copy of Windows and you've got OneDrive 
uh, enabled, then your key, the, that is the Microsoft product key, goes with your Microsoft username. So that when you reinstall it and you put in your Microsoft username and password, it knows you're a licensed user. Pretty important. In this presentation, which I've just sent to you, you've got it by email now, there are a lot of notes about how to work out whether your copy of Windows is licensed and where you might find that information. Um, you, and I've mentioned to you, you need a working and configured OneDrive account. Now, OneDrive comes with Windows. Whether you like it or not, it's there. You get a certain amount of data for free, which is heaps for many people. Um, but like, if you're like many of us, you actually buy some more as well, but you don't need to. And if you're not using OneDrive, well, folks, you should be. Um, I know the trainers in this room today will, would very strongly support my saying to you that OneDrive is a wonderful solution for backing up material. There are many notes associated with the, this slide, and I've, and I've said please download the notes from the AvPals website. In fact, I've also taken the liberty of sending it to you by email because I'm very conscious that not much of it appears on the screen. So here we go, step one. We're going to insert this new flash drive, which doesn't have to be empty, by the way. As part of the process, it will automatically empty it for you. You're going to stick it into your new, your good computer, the one that you're using right now, if you're using a, a PC. You put it in, and if any windows pop up, just close them. Um, you're not going to be doing it now, so I, this is something you'll do later, and all the steps are, are available to you in these notes. You're going to download a copy of Windows 10, not just any Windows 10, but today's Windows 10, one that was produced probably yesterday. They update it very, very regularly. And if you download it the day you do this, you'll have the latest copy and there'll be no need for further updates in the short term. This does not affect your current PC. When you download it, you're actually downloading it and putting it onto this flash drive. It's got nothing to do with your current computer scene. You don't have, need to have no fear about that. And you need to carefully follow the instructions to create what Windows call is the media tool. They even provide this media tool. I'm going to show you a little video now that I made a little earlier to show you these steps. And when the, all the steps are through, you've got to remember to take the flash drive, the, the, the thumb drive, this little thing, out of your computer before you get on with doing whatever else you've got to do, because you'll be using that thumb drive on the old computer uh, when it's time for you to do the reinstallation. So this slide that you're about to see was pre-recorded by me yesterday, and I'll talk you through it as we're going. You're looking at the desktop of Windows. This is the standard desktop for Windows, and I'm opening up Microsoft Edge. You can open up any web browser you like. And up in the address bar, you're going to click up there once and you're going to type in words, anything you like, really, but you're going to put in um, the words download Windows 10 and press enter. Up will come the screen and you'll click on the first link, which is a Microsoft website. Make sure it is. And there's the screen you'll first come to. And a bit down the page is an option that says download tool. That's the one you want. So we're going to click it and it will download to your computer. And there it is up on the right hand corner. And you're going to open it by clicking the open button. It just takes a few seconds to initialize itself and it will ask you some questions. It has the usual ubiquitous statement, getting a few things ready, which is Microsoft speak for just having a bit of a look around your computer to see what I can find. Now, for the purposes of, of, of brevity, I have edited this email to cut out some of the long delays between things. And this little area does I go on for a few minutes. So um, you'll see me jump in a few seconds and get rid of the delay. At the moment, we're doing nothing. It's just sitting there getting a few things ready. I often wonder what it really means. But it's going to say to us, 
you need to tick the little box that says uh, allow. And it's still getting a few things ready. It's going to now download from Microsoft a full copy of Windows. And it brings it in in a special sort of file to your computer called an ISO file, I-S-O. And you don't have to know that. It just come, It just arrives on your computer and will be, without your intervention, will be put onto that flash drive that you previously put into the computer. It's something you need not um, worry yourself about too much. Just let it all happen. It's still getting a few things ready. Won't be long now. Here we go. It's asking, do you want to upgrade the PC? Well, we don't. What we want to do is create the installation media USB flash drive. So I've changed that option to read the bottom one. And I've clicked on next. It's asking us, do we want to use the English language and blah, 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 blah. Yes, you always will. Don't change anything there and click next. Now it's saying, do you want to use the USB flash drive? And you certainly do because that's why you put it in there. Now it's asking you which flash drive do you want to use? Now I happen to have two on my computer, so I've chosen the one that is the small one. I knew which one it was because I knew its name. And it's now downloading Windows 10. And the progress is shown on the screen. At the moment it's showing 0%. And this will take, uh, takes about 15 to 20. It depends entirely whether you've got fast internet access or not. I've got dreadfully slow internet access because I'm one of the disadvantaged few who still use ADSL, but it's not bad. I've edited this video to get rid of some of this because the speed of it downloading is, uh, is as you can see, slow, but you'll notice those numbers are climbing up pretty quickly. When it gets to 100%, it will just carry on by itself. Um, you don't have to click anything just for the time being. You'll see what happens in a minute. So let's just recap what this is happening. You put the USB stick into your good computer. You went to that website that I mentioned, and you are now downloading Windows 10, and it is being put onto your flash drive. You'll notice the progress is now showing 92%. It would have taken a little longer than this. But surprisingly, not much. It really depends on the speed of that computer you're using. So, so far, we haven't even touched your, your old computer, the one that you're going to do up. So I, I think you'll agree at this stage, it's pretty easy. It's verifying my download now to make sure that it's correct. This only takes a few seconds. It says progress is 0%, but in actual fact, it only takes a little while. And you can continue to use your computer if you want to during this time. You don't have to sit there and stare at the screen because uh, you might have other important things to do. You might be gone for a walk or not gone for a coffee. So um, here we are. The progress is moving along quite quickly and it doesn't take very long, this part of it. And it says your USB flash drive is ready. So I need to click the finish button. It cleans up. And frankly, that's it. You've now got a full copy of Windows on that flash drive that you put in there, on that eight gigabyte or bigger flash drive. And you don't need to really do anything more. Your computer is now there and I can take the flash drive out. I'm taking it out of my computer now, which I've just done. There it is in my hand. And that can now be used in the new computer. So as we move along in the steps that we're going to be talking about, we're going to tell you to insert that flash drive now into your old computer. So here I am, I'm holding the old computer in my hand and I'm going to push the stick into it like so. So it's just sitting in the side. You can do this before the computer starts. Um, you must do it before the computer starts. So you do it like that before you actually start it. So you've inserted the new flash drive into the old PC. And you restart the PC using the boot key. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is perhaps the trickiest part of the course. The boot key on a computer, on a PC, varies depending on the brand. For many of us, it's the ESC, the escape key, the key in the top left-hand corner of your keyboard. And as the computer starts, if you just tap that key, tap, 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 often it but not always, depends on the brand, it will bring up a screen you've not seen before. 
However, it could be another key. It could be um, the F2 key, function key number two, or it could be function key number 10, or it could be function key number 12. They're all options. And my advice to you is if you've got, for example, a Dell laptop, then or Dell desktop, it'll I know it's function key 12. But in my um, in my little HP, it's the escape key. So what I would do is I'd do a Google search and ask the question, what is the boot key for my Toshiba laptop? And the screen will tell you, Google will tell you what your particular key is. Why do you need to do this? The reason is you don't want your old computer to start up by looking at its hard drive. You want that old computer to start up looking at the new flash drive. And so you have to select that flash drive during part of the boot sequence. That's the hardest part of today's course, working out how to do that. After you've done it two or three times, it's, it's quite obvious. But the first time you do it, you might feel threatened by it, but you cannot do yourself any harm. So you, do, you, you simply select the option that you want to boot from this USB stick and it, up will come a screen saying installing Windows. And it will ask you the question, where do you want to install it? You just basically have to click next. You don't have to do anything more complicated than that. If you have any issues in this area, by all means, feel free to email me at info at avpals.com and I'll help you on an individual basis. But really, it's not too difficult. You let it go through. It basically doesn't ask you any questions until it comes to the point of asking you to enter a product key. And if it does do that, it doesn't always do, but if it does, choose the option to skip that option. You don't need to enter a product key because you probably don't know it. Let it just run on by itself. Then, then it will ask you for your Windows username and password, and I hope you all know what that is. If you don't, you should get that straight in your mind beforehand. And once you put your Windows username and password in, assuming you had previously configured OneDrive properly, it will know that you've got a license for Windows. Step three, you restart the old, you take out the stick, by the way, out of the old computer, restart your old PC and the new Windows is on it. That, folks, is it. It's not, more, and not that much more complicated. I would then immediately configure OneDrive on that old computer and bring back the documents that you have previously saved into OneDrive. If you're not comfortable with using OneDrive, and I really think we're going to have to run another one of these courses next term, talking more about OneDrive, because it is so important to the way Windows works nowadays, you may have done a backup in some other way. You may have saved all those documents to an external hard drive. Well, fine, that's perfectly okay. Just copy them back into your new copy of Windows. And that's it, your installation is complete. There is really nothing more to it than that. I've rushed away with this because I wanted to give you plenty of time to talk. There is a bit more to mention. Oh, there is a little bit more to mention because there is a little bit more to mention. Um, I wanted to also bring to your attention another choice. And that's a thing called Linux, L-I-N-U-X. Linux Mint, in my case, is a, an absolutely magical operating system, very like Windows. It operates in the same way. It has the same start button. It has the same desktop. It has the same documents system. Um, it comes complete with all sorts of wonderful tools, including a web browser, anyone you want to use, email, music player, video player, editor, book reader, uh, word processing, PDF reader, Spotify, Netflix, 45,000 free programs you can run on the computer. No viruses ever. There are no viruses for Linux. There's no charge ever. You don't have to pay any money. And this will work on a really old computer. Uh, if yours is extremely old and you struggle with the Windows option, that this Linux Mint um, is uh, terrific. I'm on the Australian development team for Linux Mint, and I, I, it's what I use all day. I don't use Windows, frankly. I love Linux Mint. I find it's quick, 
It works on old hardware. And um, in fact, the course I'm presenting to you today is done on in Linux. I'm doing I, my desktop is exactly as you see it on the screen there. So you perhaps you want to encourage me to do another course next term on Linux. It is a, a truly delightful program and really easy to install. So that, folks, is our little presentation today. And I'd like to hope that you might uh, find um, some questions you might like to ask me. And um, if you want me to go over any of it, please do please do so. You will have received in this interim an email from me with a, an attachment with all, these, all this information on it. But by all means, go ahead now and, and ask any questions you might like to ask me. Um, just clarifying the information, it's Glenda. Yes, Glenda. Um, just clarifying where your data goes to and how it comes back. I know yes. you said, but could you just clarify that? Absolutely. Uh, the very fact you've asked the question <laughs> means you've got an understanding of what's happening here. I'm suggesting that as a route on a routine basis, I have on my good computer OneDrive working perfectly. And OneDrive is a connection to the Microsoft Cloud services. It backs up to, your, to Microsoft all your documents, your pictures, your videos, uh, your music, or whatever else you want to go there. In my case, um, uh, it's quite a lot of material. I've got, I've got, I've got 40-odd thousand photos, but I'm not that unusual. Um, they're all kept in OneDrive. So that all stays up in OneDrive. And when I want to use it, that's where it comes from. When I reinstall Windows on another computer, I ask OneDrive to bring it all back, which it does automatically. Once you install it, it brings all that stuff, another copy, another copy back. So it's, a, it's a cloud computer. thing. It's, 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 it's a cloud, cloud. thing. Right. OneDrive okay. is the same as Google Drive, One, uh, OneDrive, and the Apple iCloud are three well-known services. Other ones include Dropbox and many others. Does that explain it, Clinda? Yep, yep. Um, it's just I've got another little issue, which is not oh. relevant, really. The um, I, I keep on getting, whenever I turn my laptop on, that the, my I, my cloud day, um, what's his, are out, out of date. Uh, your what, what's out of date? iCloud. iCloud okay, settings, yes. settings are out of date. Yes. Well, that iCloud, of course, is your, your Apple uh, material. Yes, right, yeah. Um, and if it's out of date, it might just be simply a matter of putting in the the your Apple user ID and password again. Right. Um, maybe I will let one of the other Apple experts in this room, and there are a few, explain that too. Maybe, um, Peter, would you like to discuss that? Not particularly, no, thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret. Thank you. <laughs> Margaret. <laughs> okay. um, if, if it says that... Uh, I'll just ask Google. <laughs> Glenda, Glenda, I think I, what I would do is just go into the settings for iCloud and make sure that you've got your username and password. I think it needs it refreshed every few months. Right. I think it, okay. you, know, you need to do it occasionally. Yes. Okay. Yep. I'm sure that's right, Glenda. Just go into the settings for iCloud and, and yep. you, sh you sh should see the ability to re-enter all the information or edit the information anyway. Okay. Thank you. I have, have any other questions? Can I have a question? Sure, Peter. Um, you used two computers there. You used a so-called good computer and a so-called old computer. Yes. Do you need to use two computers? Good point. Very good point. You really only need the good computer once, which you can use anybody's for. It doesn't have to be yours to create the USB stick. You can't, so do, you, that from the, you can't do that from the old computer then? If it's working, you can. Oh, yes. okay. No problem. You can use the old one, but I'm assuming it's so bad it won't work. So No, I've just got one that, that works but very slowly. Yes, well, then in that case, use it by all means. Okay. No reason not to. And, um, uh, yes, the download, if it's old, the download might take a while, but, you know, go off and have a cup of tea or two cups of tea. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I keep referring to the old computer and the new computer because I'm taking the assumption that the old one is really old and, and is, you know, out of control, full of viruses and things. Any other questions you'd like to ask me? 
I have one, if I may, Paul. Certainly you can. Um, I'm assuming that the old computer has to have a certain size to it. Um, really, if it's, if it's, it would have to be very old to the point of craziness. Um, Windows requires about, uh, don't hold me to this exactly, 20 gigs of space to run itself. Well, I don't think there's been a laptop produced with a disk that small for, say, 20 years. Um, so the, the, that will never be a problem. Okay. And then on the other um, question, you Linux Mint. Yes. Um, it, you're very fond of it, I can tell. Yeah, I am. Very fond <laughs> um, of it. If, if um, say, I went and bought an extremely cheap something or other, mm and I wanted to put Linux Mint on that, what, what would I need to buy? You buy the cheapest non-Chromebook. Don't buy a Chromebook because right. Chromebooks don't run anything else but Google Chrome. That's it. Right. But you can go and buy the lowest end laptop or can I suggest you even consider buying one on the Northern Beaches, buy, swap and sell or something like that. You know, I mean, you should be able to buy one secondhand for $50. Okay. Um, you know, the, these, they're not worth anything secondhand. But if you want to buy a new one, you can spend $300 and buy one uh, with a Celeron processor from Officeworks or something, and they work perfectly well. Now, it will come with Windows, which is such a waste because you're buying that licence. And you, right. cannot, you cannot buy a laptop today without something on it. Mm -hmm. which is a bit of a shame. But um, you to, to install Linux Mint on it is relatively easy. And if you're in the slightest bit interested, have a look at, do a Google search for Linux Mint, have a bit of a read of it. She'll um, tell me. It, they tell you exactly how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you how to do it. You Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I like it because it, the word processor in it is so like Word. The mm -hmm. spreadsheet in it is so like um, Excel. The files it creates are the same as the ones used by Microsoft. You can swap them around back and forth. It has OneDrive built into it. It has Google Drive built into it. Um, it has Dropbox. It has everything you would use with Windows, except there's no charge and it's much lighter, lighter in, in need of, 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 of overall processing power. So what does it actually look like? That little okay. screen I showed you earlier, um, yes. Uh, which is just looks exactly like Windows. In fact, you oh, can right. make it look very like Windows if you want to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Paul, um, I wasn't sure from your presentation at what point the documents on the old computer were purged. Is that something that you did beforehand? That's a very good, yep, good point, you, John. You have to, you, you, it all happens totally automatically. As soon as you put restart your computer and say install windows from that stick it immediately wipes every single thing off that hard disk right thank you including all the bad things as well <laughs> any other questions yep you should be yes. able to put um windows 10 on any tablet is that right sorry just say that again sharon can you put windows 10 on any tablet no, no, you can't. You need to put, um, I mean, most of the tablets are either run the op Apple operating system or Android. Uh, there have been cases in the past, and please, I stand corrected if this is not correct, but no, Windows doesn't run on, on your regular tablet you might have around. However, there are some laptops that look like tablets uh, that are created, made by Microsoft, including their wonderful Surface uh, laptop, which looks like a tablet, which definitely runs Windows 10, but no, your old tablet, probably not. Greg, you had something to say? Just give me a second. I want to try and get this in focus if I can. Uh... Yes, I see. IBM ThinkPad. Yeah, ThinkPad. Now, this computer was given to me 10 years ago and it had been used in a, a business for five years, so it's 15 years old. Um, I think it was called a ThinkPad before they even called them laptops. Um, 10 years ago, I tried to put Windows 8 on it and it wouldn't work. So I put Linux on it, worked beautifully. 
do you think it's worth uh, the reason why I use it? And that's uh, something I want to add to the conversation is that when I go overseas, when, when we do, I take that with me uh, and use it because it costs me nothing. If it gets knocked off, I haven't lost anything. <laughs> um, so that's a good thing why you really do need to have a, a second laptop to take away with you so you don't lose your good one. But my question is, it's got Linux on it at the moment because I couldn't load Windows 8 on it. Do you think it's worth a try at loading the latest Windows 10 on it? And if that doesn't work, just um, put Linux Mint on it because it's only got Linux on it. Well, well, uh, Greg, I just, uh, I just uh, I wish we were all standing around the room to be able to show you how easy this works. It's just one of the weaknesses of, of Zoom, isn't it? Um, definitely you should try putting Windows 10 back on it. Uh, follow the steps that we've just discussed read the notes again, ask me by email. If for some reason the laptop is way too old, and it is possible, but it would have to be at least uh, 16 years old to be too old. Uh, if it wouldn't go on, then Linux Mint will run on it. And so when you go to run Windows on this old laptop of yours, it's immediately going to wipe out the Linux that's there. If it doesn't work and you put the Linux on, it will wipe out the attempt you made by Windows. So whatever you use last is the one that works. Um, I'm not going to complicate the thing too much by telling you you can run both of them, but you certainly can. It's called dual booting. But from the purposes of your old laptop, I'd have a go at the Windows to start with. So can I just clarify that it's either Linux or Windows? Not quite, Linux. Oh. <laughs> you, can do, you can do both. On right, the one right. laptop, but it's way beyond what we're doing here. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So what I'm suggesting is you try the Windows thing first on your old laptop. If it works well, you're going to be smiling. You're going to say, well, look at that. My old laptop, which I haven't used for all those years, or, or if I have, it was very slow, it was now working well. But if for some reason it doesn't work or you want to try the Linux, which I, which I obviously commend to you, mm. then we can do another course next term on how you might easily install Linux. Can I ask another question, please? Paul? You may, Peter. I noticed that um, when, when you were starting to download um, the, the Windows program onto the memory stick, yes. it gave several um, choices. Yes. And one of them was 32 or 64 bit. Yes. Do we need to take account of that or not? Because my. There is, a, there is a slight, my... Yeah, yeah, it's a good point, Peter. The, there is a slight chance that your laptop is so old that it's 32 bit. Mine is. Okay. Well, in that case, download the 32 bit one. Okay. But having said that, um, for, the, for, a rest, for the rest of us, go for the 64. If the 64 doesn't work, well, then just start again, put the stick back in and download, choose the option that says 32-bit. We're not going to get into the complexities of the difference between the two. Okay. But frankly, um, if you've got a, a very old laptop, it runs on a, on a different system and requires this thing called 32-bit architecture. So you will, in your case, Peter, you realise that's going to be necessary. But for the most of us, the 64-bit will work. Okay, thank you. May I ask another question, Paul? Certainly, John. Yes. Um, the applications are not going to be downloaded from uh, OneDrive, are they? Each application needs to be loaded independently of this process you've just described. Uh, this is a, a, an each way bet here, John. Uh, firstly, if the application is something like Adobe Photoshop, well, then clearly you're going to have to reinstall that. If you're using uh, Office, the Office suite, you'll have to reinstall that. But all the things that come with Windows, that is the normal things like Mail, the browser, um, all of their, their picture viewer, their video editor, they all come in as part of this installation. Okay. It is getting to the point where, unless you use some specialty software on your laptop, there's not much else you need apart from what comes with Windows. They've become so good these extra things that really there's not much point uh, unless you've got some particular need to change it. Mm -hmm. I've you. got family uh, program, family tree maker, and yep. I've also got a disc for my printer, which operates wirelessly. So I would have to reinstall that. 
The printer, probably not, because if you've got a wireless printer, as long as it's turned on, when you first start the laptop, it should recognise it straight away. Right. There are exceptions to that rule. Mm -hmm. The family tree maker, yes, you will have to reinstall the family tree maker software. Can I say to you, if you use the Linux Mint, he says with another, <laughs> another <laughs> sales story, um, it will definitely recognise your printer. It's much better at it than Windows. It never fails to recognise the printer. And secondly, your family tree maker uh, works perfectly well in Linux. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Are we done? So, so folks, um, you, you've got by email now. If you checked your email, you'll find these. This, yep, I've got the stuff. notes. Good. Yep. And you will also, uh, in about uh, an hour or a couple of hours, there will be a copy of this um, presentation on our website.